Sometimes some of you might wonder <coughs> what we actually do in meditation and how we go about it, what do we do, what the benefit of meditation is. And uh, how meditation would be useful to us in our daily life. I suggested that we assume a comfortable posture for a short period of time like an hour or so, and try to practice meditation. Sitting position is not absolutely necessary, and yet for a short period of practice, good posture makes the practice more comfortable, easy. After all, this short period of time that we sit in comfortable position, we try to gain certain degree of composure, quietness, peace, and uh, togetherness, one-pointedness. Therefore the posture helps us to gain this basic suitable atmosphere for the practice of meditation. Therefore, we have to assume a posture. The best posture is the lotus posture. Lotus posture is putting one leg over the other. Now, 
like this and take the other one, put over the other one. Take one, take the left foot over the thigh or the right leg and the right foot over the calf of the left leg and put in your hands together in right hand on the left. If this position is uncomfortable, we recommend people to sit in half lotus position. It is just putting the right leg over the left calf, right foot over the left calf. And that is somewhat comfortable. Perhaps most of you are more comfortable sitting in this position. And then again putting your hands on your lap, right hand on the left, touching thumbs each other and straighten your back, relax your muscles and take few deep breaths to notice the sensation of touch of breath. Now this is not breathing exercise, not manipulating breath not holding breath, just we let the breath flow as it normally does and we simply pay bare attention to the breath. That is how we start meditation. Breath is universal, all living beings share in common. It does not have any biases, prejudices. We don't have any greed, hatred and any delusion about the bread. It is so simple, easily transportable. Wherever we go, we carry it with us. And uh, we have no any doubt about its present. Moreover, in the practice of meditation, we try to keep our mind in the present, on a neutral ground. We shouldn't have any emotional implication, that we don't rationalize it, no, neither we do philosophize it or psychologize it. We just have something natural, simple, common, universal, without any ethnic, geographical, religious connotation, and something flowing all the time without any particular effort we should be able to focus our attention on it to be in the present, to experience the present. When we try to experience the present, if we don't have subject like this, all we would have would be thoughts, ideas, memories, hallucinations, fantasies, daydreams and planning and so forth and so on, which also may distract our attention. Moreover, 
they would defeat the very purpose of meditation if we try to cultivate them. Now let us take <coughs> our walking itself. Why we walk that slowly? Because we want to see the detail of walking. Do you notice there are several things involved in walking? We stand still from after getting up. We stand still for about 30 seconds and then slowly we bring our hands together, hold them together and then <coughs> Without losing the awareness of breathing, we want to walk. We have been sitting and watch, watching, observing our breathing and we got so accustomed to it and we gained certain experience of uh, relaxation and we don't want to lose it. Therefore, using that observation of breathing, we want to walk. So, we suggest that we try to coordinate our breath with the movement of our feet. While inhaling, we lift the heel of one foot and while exhaling we rest that foot on toes and again while inhaling we lift the whole leg carry it forward shift it little away from us and while exhaling slowly we lower the foot down until it touches the floor. Then again, while inhaling, we lift the other foot, the heel of the other foot, and while exhaling, rest it on toes, and again while inhaling, lift the whole foot, carry it forward, shift it little away from us and slowly lower it down until it touches the floor. But when we walk from here to there about 10 feet, we take 10 minutes. And during these 10 minutes, if we remain mindful, we can learn enormous amount of things about ourselves, about our movements and we can see nothing <coughs> from the moment we start walking from this end to that and nothing remains unchanged. Everything, every feeling, every bit of energy, every movement is changed. We want to notice it. And in order to see this in detail, we slow down and make this slow walk. Then, one more thing we got to remember, not only in walking, but in all other mental, physical phenomena. In this mind and body combination. There is no one central single entity which makes all these things happen. That very mind which is so powerful which creates 
energy which creates even life. Itself is changing. That very mind with just all these things, you know, so miracle, powerful thing, miraculous things is done by the mind. That very mind is able to do all these things because of the very nature of change. It is changing. That means nothing in this body and mind is there unchanged, permanent, eternal. Now, we learn three things out of all these things when we remain mindful and walk mindfully or do anything mindfully. We learn these three things always. Three things. In fact, seeing these three things exactly as they are is the sole purpose of mindfulness. Seeing these three things exactly as they are leads us to eradicate our greed, hatred and delusion. What are the three things? What are the three things? We see things are impermanent. If the things are impermanent, why should we hold on to any grudge, any hatred, any greed, anything, why should we hold on to? There's no reason. Accept our ignorance and greed. Otherwise, no reason. And yet, we grasp and hold on to things. If we cultivate our mindfulness, as mindfulness develops, we learn to let things go. That means we see, as we see the impermanence of everything, we become so comfortable, relaxed, and don't want to hold on to anything. Second thing we learn is that which is impermanent can cause a great deal of unsatisfactoriness. Why? Though the things are impermanent, the desire for their permanency makes things uncomfortable. Meaning, we don't want things to be impermanent. The desire does not want anything to, imperm to be impermanent, especially desirous things. Desire does not want any desirable thing to be impermanent. Desire may wish undesirable things to be impermanent, but not the desirable things. Desire wants desirable things to remain the same for all, all the time, perpetually. Unfortunately, even the desirable things are subject to change. And therefore, the desire creates pain. And that's what we learn from this observation. Now, we do many things in our life to make ourselves happy. Practically everything, consciously, willingly, we do in every waking moment in our life in order to gain happiness. 
peace, solace and comfort. And almost all of them entail not real peace, solace, comfort and happiness. On the contrary, greed, hatred, delusion, and sometimes temporary excitement. In the name of happiness, in pursuit of happiness, people try to excite themselves. You take a vacation and go to beaches, go to places of entertainment, travel, meet people, play games, all will enhance your excitement. And then you need some time to rest from your entertainment, from your vacation. And then go back to your regular daily life, daily activities. And you would not see any peace, solace and comfort <coughs> in those things. No real happiness at all. Nobody wants to be unhappy. Therefore we do all these things to make ourselves happy. People sometimes feel when they are alone, they are not happy, they marry and live a wedded life for a while and they find they, then they find that doesn't bring them happiness, then they divorce and live for a while as divorced people and then find no happiness, then remarry. So, you think of all kind of things, day and night, to make yourself happy. Some people take refuge in drinks, alcoholic drinks, drugs, and sometimes people are trying to find happiness by killing, stealing, making others miserable. So when you really think for a moment, you may find countless things we do in order to make our lives happy. And instead of approaching happiness, gaining happiness, we would be far removed away from happiness. Why? Because we abuse our freedom of choice. We are born free and we do not know how to choose freedom. To think freely is very wonderful, very great, but to think rightly using freedom is greater, more wonderful. So to gain true happiness and peace, we have to learn a way to use our freedom of thinking. What is the way to gain real happiness? What we have to do to gain real happiness? To gain real happiness, we have to adjust the very instrument that experiences happiness. That is our own minds. The mind experiences happiness, not the body. 
for one of the very important purposes of this meditation is to readjust, clear, purify our mind. Why are we not happy in spite of all we do in pursuit of happiness? Because the very instrument that seeks happiness is not clean, is not pure. That is, our mind is not pure, clean. Through the practice of meditation we try to purify the mind. When we think or say or do something with impure mind, we always experience displeasure, unhappiness, misery, pain and trouble. It's compared to a bull that pulls a cart. Perhaps some of you might have not seen carts pulling, uh, 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 bulls pulling carts. Just imagine a bull that pulls a cart is not happy. The cart is heavy, it follows its the bull's hoops all the time he pulls the cart. It's very painful, very heavy. Why? Why does the bull go go through the pain? Because he does not know better. He is a bull, an ox. Bull does not represent wisdom, intelligence. Similarly, when the mind is impure, unclear, full of ignorance, people do various things in pursuit of happiness and yet because the mind is not pure, they do wrong things, say wrong things, have wrong opinions, mind is cloudy. So the results of what they do with such impure mind would be very heavy, unpleasant, burdensome. So their entire life is painful, entire life is full of burden full of agony, pain, suffering. On the other hand, if the mind is pure, clean, the life is very light, very comfortable, clean, like your own shadow, which it, which it doesn't matter where the shadow is, in front of you, behind you, by your side, you don't even feel that there is shadow. Similarly, when the mind is pure, clean, and you do things with pure and clean mind, the results will be so light. Entire life is very light, comfortable, peaceful. So one of the purposes of meditation is to make our life light, not burdensome. For some people, from the day they are born till they pass away, they live, they drag their life with tremendous amount of pain, suffering, agony. It's a heavy burden. They don't want to live, but they have to, so they just live. Through the practice of meditation, as we purify our mind, 
we make our life very simple, easily livable, comfortable, light, pleasant, and happy. How we gain this happiness? Through this practice. How we make our mind pure, clean. When we sit, start watching our breath. Breath becomes very light. Body becomes relaxed. Mind becomes relaxed. And we continue to watch this relaxed, fine breath. Every time mind wanders, we bring it back to the breath and anchor it there. Anchor the mind on the breath. Paying simple, bare attention, undivided attention, total attention to the breath. And then, as you keep focusing your attention on breath, you gain further relaxation, lightness, and that overcomes your heaviness, drowsiness, sleepiness. By the way, when the body and the mind become relaxed, some people naturally fall asleep instead of being awake they fall asleep. Falling asleep in meditation is very natural, especially when people did not have good sleep prior to the meditation, or if they have a lot of food in their stomach at the time they sit to meditate, or if they are very tired physically, or if they are mentally very lethargic, they feel sleepy, drowsy, especially when the body and mind are relaxed. We recommend few things for such, to overcome such situations, such as when we meditate, we normally close our eyes. And when we feel sleepy, we open our eyes, roll our eyeballs, look around and close our eyes and start the practice, washing the breath. And then if we feel sleepy, we hold our ear lobes with thumb and finger and press hard. That pinch of ear loss with your thumb and finger wake you up. You have to press real hard to wake you up. If you feel that, if you think that your pressing may hurt you, then uh, you may be checking out, go to sleep. Hmm. But if you really want to wake you up, you have to press your ear lobes a little hard. And close your eyes again and start the practice. Sometimes even that may not work for some people. Then they must take very deep breaths and hold the breath and let it go very slowly and then breathe again. 
and hold it and let it go very slowly. If you do it several times, you may perspire. That perspiration takes care of your sleepiness. If that doesn't work, you may get up and walk slowly, up and down, using the technique of walking meditation, which we explained earlier, and we may repeat the explanation later on. Or, if that doesn't work, get up, wash your face with cold water, and come back and sit and meditate. If none of these works, you may have a good sleep and come back and meditate. Having overcome your sleepiness like this, you start the practice and then you gain certain confidence because something is working, something you have done right. You have great effort, you are mindful, perseverant, you want to practice, you want to continue and come back and sit, then you have to be hundred percent sincere to yourself, there is no cheating, you are not cheating anybody but yourself, keeping that in mind, <coughs> sit up and try to focus your attention on your breathing then you may gain certain confidence from your practice. This confidence overcomes your doubt. Whatever doubt you may have in the practice will dissipate and disappear as confidence arises. That gives you further encouragement, makes your body and mind more relaxed and you begin to feel that you are gaining something. And then stay in that position. You may not be sleepy, not drowsy, you may be energetic, more mindful. And then this confidence, energetic, wakeful experience gives rise to joy. As joy arises, your resentment, dislike, disappointment, anger, hatred will subside temporarily leaves the mind. <coughs> Until you come to this point, you may still be unsteady. Friends, hatred is one of the most difficult psychic irritants or state of mind that many people succumb to. They cannot overcome it. During meditation, before meditation, after meditation, they experience a tremendous degree of hatred, resentment. Out of all other defilements, hatred makes lives more uncomfortable, miserable, painful. We have to trace the beginning, as far as we can, we can go, of our hatred. We may find the beginning is within us. There is a root for hatred. That root is not actually implanted, inculcated within us by somebody. Adults, parents, 
society, teachers, other people may enrich it, support it, help us cultivate it, to grow it. But in the final analysis, we have the root of hatred within us. That comes to us from our previous existence, previous lives. And therefore, we have no right to blame anybody. Nobody in the world is totally responsible for our hatred, for our misery, our resentment. For example, when you look at an object, a person, a scene, a situation, you may dislike it. Who asked you to dislike it? Did anybody teach you to dislike certain thing? Certain situation? Certain idea? Certain persons? Certain way of life? Did anybody teach you? Nobody teach you to hate certain situation, certain appearance, certain food, certain music, certain places, nobody. So that comes from within yourself. How does that come from within yourself? Nowhere, no moment in your life, entire life from your infancy right up to the point where you became to, began to understand this, has anybody taught you a way to hate certain things. That comes from within yourself. That comes from your previous life's experience. That comes from the root of hatred that you have within yourself. Therefore, nobody on earth is responsible for your resentment, hatred. Neither you yourself are responsible for it. So therefore, it is sheer foolishness to blame anybody. Blame parents, teachers, society, or even yourself. Don't blame anybody. Look at the root of hatred exactly as it is and try to penetrate right to the very bottom of this root of hatred. And then start from there to see how destructive it is. It is like cancer. It makes our all our experiences unpleasant. Therefore it is compared to a patient suffering from jaundice. A patient suffering from jaundice would never appreciate food, no matter how delicious food you to prepare and present to a patient suffering from jaundice, he would never appreciate food because the faculty that tastes food is defective, is affected by this particular disease called jaundice. Therefore he will shun anything away saying this is bland, that is bland, this is not tasty, this is more salty, and so forth and so on. Similarly, when we are charged and affected very deeply by our own hatred, we can never appreciate anything in the world. We can never appreciate somebody, somebody's achievement, somebody's appearance, somebody's work, somebody's art, some place, some music, nothing can we appreciate. Because we are so deeply 
profoundly affected by our own roots of resentment and hatred. Don't blame anybody for that. Don't blame. So, as we relax, as we practice meditation, focusing our attention on one subject, which is free from greed, hatred and delusion, which has no any connotation of whatsoever, it is so neutral and natural. Mind has no way, no place, no nothing to cultivate hatred. Mind just remains on this neutral, supremely clean, pure object, the breath. And then body and mind relaxes. As body and mind relaxes, as joy, as I said, arises, this resentment, hatred slowly leaves the mind. You've got to experience it. You can never learn it from a book, from a teacher. Your parents, your teachers, your gurus may tell everything about it. You will never experience it until and unless you do it yourself. Practice. And then you definitely will come to this point. We are talking from our experience. We cannot make you experience unless you do it yourself. And then as hatred disappears, joy begins to grow. By repeating the word joy, we will, we will never experience joy. Sometimes people sing the word joy, joy, joy many millions of times. I have heard people do so and I have seen them not very joyful in spite of the repetition of this word for millions of times. It is very much like repeating a menu in a restaurant. You will never taste the food in <laughs> menu if you repeat it. You go to order the food and eat. So cultivate this within yourself and then experience joy without uttering any word of joy. Then as joy grows, increases, there arises another degree of very sublime state of mind. That is what is called happiness. Happiness normally excitement is called happiness. When people are excited they call their happy. For example, if someone touches a lottery and gets a couple of millions of dollars, he might say that he is happy. If he finds his own desired life partner in life, he would say he is happy. If he gets whatever material thing he desires, he might say he is happy. If he achieves something in life, materially, he might say he is happy. And all these are examples of excitement. When this excitement arises, they express excitement in words. Physically they express it by singing, dancing, laughing, talking, hugging, kissing, jumping up and down. They will express this excitement. Children do it. 
one doesn't necessarily have to be an adult to do it. Even children can do it. Animals do it. When animals are excited, you can see dogs when they are excited. When you come home after a long day, leaving a dog inside the house, as soon as you open the door, you can see the dog says excitement, he will jump all over your body to express its excitement. We human beings do, do express our excitement like that sometimes, and that is not happiness. That is so ephemeral, so temporary, so artificial sometimes, and it disappears. Once the excitement disappears, we will be back again at the point where we started. And back below that, we may go. From meditation, when real happiness arises, excitement leaves the mind. When happiness arises, we feel happiness so deeply, so profoundly, and so refinedly and subtly that we don't want the happiness to ooze out from our body. We want the happiness to stay still within ourselves. It is so serene, calm, quiet, composed, so cool that it makes our body and mind still, quiet, not jump, jumping up and down, not running, not kissing, hugging. There is no way that a meditator who experiences happiness would express his happiness like excitement. He contains, stays, he is contented. And that quiet, serene, calm, composed state of mind gives rise to concentration. Body and mind have to be quiet, composed, to gain concentration. When concentration arises, clinging, grasping, craving disappears, lust disappears from the mind. People sometimes, you may, exp you may notice, when you meditate, as the body and mind relax, if you are not mindful, relaxed state of body and mind, can arouse your lust, your craving, your clinging. But when we are mindful and then gain concentration, the concentration guided by mindfulness would not allow the mind to grow clinging craving, grasping. Concentration sometimes may be associated with uh, clinging, gluing to something. Concentration is not just gluing to something. Ordinarily, people who use the word concentration very loosely would say, so and so is reading a book so concentrated. When you read, you gain concentration. What is the concentration you gain when you read a book? You are not actually concentrating. 
when you read a book, for example, a novel, your mind is very active. You will be with the actors and actresses, the scenes, their fights, quarrels, words, dialogues, songs, emotions, and so forth and so on in the book. And you are so deeply involved in what you read. And that involvement may get carried away. You may be overwhelmed and that is not concentration. You are participating. You are involved in it. When you listen to something, your mind is working, trying to put things together, trying to understand what you are listening to. When you speak, you have certain concentration, you want to convey a certain message and you have to have a certain degree of concentration. So, when you watch something, sometimes you can, you can see children watching movies on TVs and they are so glued to it, you hardly can take them away from TV. And all these are examples of not true concentration, but attachment, gluing, clinging, craving for certain things. But when true concentration arises from the practice of meditation, all this gluing, clinging, craving, grasping nature leaves the mind. Mind would be ready to let things go. When things are leaving, mind is mind lets them leave. To illustrate this, let me uh, tell you how in a Asian countries, in Asian uh, time, people used this gluing method to catch monkeys. When they want to catch monkeys, they put peanut into a bottle, tie the bottle to a tree. And when a monkey comes, he puts his hand into the bottle, grabs up peanut, and try to pull, and he tries to pull the hand out with the peanut in it. So he can never pull his hand out with the peanut in it. So you go and when you approach the monkey, he would struggle to run away, taking his hand out of the bottle with peanut in it, but he can never take it out unless he let peanut go. So you go and catch the monkey. Gluing to something is like that you are anchored there. You are not letting things go. When we gain true concentration, we let the things flow through our mind. We don't hold on to anything. That not hold on, holding on to anything would make you more and more relaxed, more serene, calm, comfortable. Now see how you gain certain degree of happiness, certain degree of comfort, solace, lightness, relaxation through the true practice of meditation. In that state, friends, you still remain mindful. Of course, 
if you are unmindful at any of these stages, you may slip back into something undesirable, unwanted. So the whole practice of meditation can be defeated. The purpose of meditation can be defeated if you are not mindful. Therefore, in this particular practice of meditation, in addition to paying attention to our breathing, we cultivate mindfulness. Therefore, the major factor in this meditation is mindfulness. What is mindfulness? What I tried to explain all this while was the practice of concentration, gaining some relaxation, peace and comfortable experience. That is not enough. That is just a beginning. We want something more than that. Now even this achievement of concentration we may lose, although we may be able to get it back. We may lose it. What helps us to get it back? That is our mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Mindfulness is present mindedness, knowing, seeing, understanding the true nature of existence, and at the same time to remember all the time not to grasp, not to cling to something. That is mindfulness. Also, when we are mindful, we can see all our experiences, including these beautiful, pleasant, most exquisite concentrative state of mind are in a state of flux, changing, moving, not remaining the same for two consecutive moments. This is not just mere philosophical thinking. When we deeply involve in our observation of our experience, this is exactly what we experience. Things are changing, not remaining the same. Now, if we are unmindful as things are changing, what happens is that we experience pain. One permanent thing in the whole universe of experience one permanent thing the only permanent thing of the entire universe of experience is the impermanence that is the only permanent thing. Impermanence is the only permanent thing. Now, and that is the absolute necessary factor. Absolutely necessary. Impermanence is absolutely necessary. It must, things must be impermanent. 
since things are impermanent, everything is possible. Growth is possible, change is possible, improvement is possible, learning is possible, movement is possible, hearing is possible, talking is possible, everything is possible. Now, within this impermanence and possibility of all within impermanent nature, if we have desire to make the impermanent permanent, then we experience pain, suffering. Now through the practice of mindfulness, we learn to go along with the impermanence. We don't try to stop the impermanence. If we try to stop the impermanence, we build up friction, conflict of two impossibilities. Impermanence is one impossibility, and the desire to stop impermanence is the other impossibility. Through the practice of mindfulness, we learn these two things and then learn to go along with them. That way we can sustain the peace, comfort, solace, concentration, happiness that we gain. Meaning when happiness changes, we don't be perturbed, we don't get upset because we already know through our mindfulness that even this happiness that we experience is subject to change. And that gives us greater, deeper, more profound happiness. And that's how we cultivate real, true happiness, first purifying the mind, then cultivating mindfulness. We make our lives more happy and peaceful. Thank you.